Welcome to Broadmoor Community Church, a church that does believe no matter who you are, where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. You are welcome to God's embrace. I'm Reverend Ann Cubbage, and it is my privilege to be the senior pastor at this church, and I would love to get to know you. So if you come by anytime, or if you come to worship at 10 a.m. on Sundays, please know that I hope you'll stop by to introduce yourself. And for those of you who are sitting at home, who are riding in the car, who are watching on your computers or on your phones, please know how important you are to the ministry of this church. You are a part of our congregation, and it is important that we can be in covenant with one another. So if you would like me to pray for you, please let me know. A coverage at broadmoorchurch.org. And as I said, if you're ever in town, drop by. You can certainly give me a call at 719-473-1807. And you probably have already checked out our website, but it's broadmoorchurch.org. All of those things are important because you can be a part of our ministries from afar or from close up. You simply need to let us know that you're interested. And speaking of ministries, let me tell you that as we go into Holy Week, just a week and a half away, I cannot believe it, we have several opportunities. Those can be seen on the slides at the end of the service, but I wanted to highlight the fact that on Thursday evening, Monday, Thursday, we will be having a light supper combined with a communion service and hand washing. And then on Good Friday, we don't normally have back-to-back -back services, although I know many churches do. We are going to have an amazing Tenebrae service called Right On to Die, presented by Soli Deo Gloria Chamber Singers. It's called A Lenten Story featuring Joseph Martin's Harvest of Sorrows. It begins at 7 o'clock. There will be a free will offering taken, but it will be an amazing evening of worship. And then on Saturday, we have the day before Easter, we have an Easter egg hunt for children, toddlers through fifth grade. It begins at 11 o'clock. Bring your basket or your bag and your neighbors. We would love to see you out here. On Easter morning, we will have worship at 9 a.m. and then again at 11 a.m. They are both traditional, amazing services with great music and many, many people gathering together to worship and to celebrate the resurrection. There are many other slides at the back, and I hope that you will take advantage of those. And now I would invite you to take in a deep breath. Let it out. Knowing that God is with you wherever you might find yourself and whenever whenever you are awake, asleep, or in between. We have been working through this Lenten series called Yes and No. Just say no is what I've been preaching on, on uh, during the services, because when we say no to things like shame, transactionalism, disbelief, condemnation, when we say no to those things, we open up our hearts. We allow our hearts to be more open to the filling of God's Spirit, and we can say yes. Yes to God. Yes to God's love. So I hope that you will be able to do that this day. Will you join me in prayer? Amazing and loving God, we come to you today knowing that you are with us knowing that as we have worked through the no's, the things that separate us from you, God, that we also allow ourselves to be fully filled by your Spirit, to become instruments of your grace with others. And we would ask that you would be with us as we go into this service, and as we leave it, with every person we meet, help them know that we are filled with your abundant and overflowing love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi everyone, it's Miss Liz. How are you today? It's so good to see you. 
Thanks for watching. So my friends, I want you to use your imaginations with me, okay? I want you to imagine that you are playing maybe with a sibling or maybe with a friend and your sibling or your friend just got a brand new toy. It is a fantastic toy. It's one you yourself have wanted for a long time. You look at this new toy and you want to turn playing with it. So you ask your sibling or your friend, hey, can I have a turn? And I want you to imagine that your sibling or your friend says no. They say no way. I want to keep my new toy for myself. How would that make you feel? I bet if that happened, you would look at your sibling or your friend and think, you are being very, very selfish. Yes, I think we all would think that. It's really pretty easy to recognize when somebody else is being selfish towards us. But I want you to use your imagination again. I want you to imagine that you are the one who got the brand new toy. A toy that you've wanted for a long time and is so great. And I want you to imagine that your sibling or your friend asks you if they can have a turn playing with the new toy. What would you do? Well, I think if we're honest, there have been times and there might be times in the future where we would be the ones who are being selfish. When we would be the ones who want to keep the toy all for ourselves and not give anyone else a turn. Yeah, we have all been selfish. It's pretty easy to do. We all want good things for ourselves. It's pretty natural. But my friends, God wants us to want those same good things for other people too. God wants to help us not be selfish. God wants to help us share the good things that we have with others so that everyone can have good things. I'm not saying it's easy. In fact, it's pretty hard. So why don't we say a prayer you can repeat after me and we'll just ask God for some help. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your love. Please help me not to be selfish. Please help me to want good things for other people. Please help me to share what I have. We love you, God. Amen. All right, my friends, as you go out this week, remember you can ask God for help to help you not be selfish and to want those good things for others.
hear now the scripture from John chapter 12. Some Greeks were among those who had come up to worship at the Passover festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and made a request. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Jesus replied, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I assure you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose them. And those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. Whoever serves me must follow me. Wherever I am, there my servant will also be. My Father will honor whoever serves me. Farmers know that a seed that does not die is no good at all. If it lies on the ground and never germinates, it remains a seed that never becomes the plant it was intended to be. However, when the seed lies in the ground and comes into contact with moisture, it looks like it is rotting. The shell cracks and then a green shoot of life begins to protrude. It is being transformed. Death has transformed it. It dies to what it was in order to become something else, something greater. Because of the death of that one seed, a plant will live, which will produce a great deal of fruit, as well as many more seeds. In our passage today, Jesus is asking all of us to join him in his death, not in a literal death on a cross, as was Jesus' destiny, nor any other kind of physical death necessarily, but something just as drastic and at least, well, psychologically just as painful. So what kind of death are we talking about? It is death to self. It is dying to the life we think we want to live in order to live the life God wants us to live. When we hold on to our lives so very tightly, then it is then actually that we disallow what God has in mind for us. It has been said that when Mother Teresa was passing through a crowd in Detroit, a woman remarked, her secret is that she is free to be nothing. Therefore, God can use her for anything. The phrase, unless a seed dies, is used to illustrate the idea that sometimes things must come to an end before they can begin anew. The death of the seed is necessary for the birth of new life, and the same is true for many other things in life. If we lay down our lives, then we discover a life that we never knew was possible. We must die to what we were, to become something else, something greater. We must die to those plans that are not a part of God's plan for us. We must die to the desire to control our lives. We must die to pride, to demanding our own way, to stubbornness and to selfishness. What I have discovered is that when I die to those things, I come alive for the first time. I only thought I was living before. There was no real contentment or fulfillment. I was just existing. In order to live, to live abundantly, we must die to anything that we are depending on for purpose and happiness other than God. Don't you think it's time to say no to self-centeredness? Most of us would agree that we are a very self-conscious and self-centered society. The baby boom generation, of which I am a member, has been labeled the me generation. But we are not the first generation to be preoccupied with ourselves. One summer in the 1940s, Nabokov, the Russian novelist, stayed with James Laughlin, literary publisher, in Alta, Utah, where Nabokov took the opportunity to enlarge his collection of butterflies. 
One evening at dusk, he returned from his day's excursion, saying that during hot pursuit near Bear Gulch, he had heard someone groaning most piteously down by the stream. Did you stop? Laughlin asked him. No, I had to get that butterfly, Nabokov said. The next day, the corpse of an aged prospector was discovered in what has now been renamed in Nabokov's honor, Dead Man's Gulch. While people around us are dying, how often we chase butterflies. Steve Sable, former CEO of NFL Films and recipient of 38 Emmys, wrote a blog in which he gave and named three related and similar expressions of self-centered culture. The first he named was individualism, where we live our lives as if others don't matter, much as Nabokov did. Their motto is, I've got to do what's best for me. The theme song could be, I did it my way. One of the causes of our inconsiderate and rude society is individualism. Sable's second expression of our self-centered culture is secularism, an attitude that says, God doesn't matter. Most of these folks believe in God. They just don't believe God is relevant. They don't want to know that God has a plan for their lives. It's like, God, you stay on your side of the fence and I'll stay on mine. You don't bother me and I won't bother you. You handle the world, I'll handle my own life. They don't think they need God until they do. The writer of Psalm 10 wrote, a wicked man in his pride thinks that God doesn't matter. Can we become so full of ourselves that we don't have room for God? The answer is yes. The problem with a self-made man is that he often ends up worshiping his maker. Mm -hmm. He lives for himself. Sable's third category was one we have heard much about in the past several years narcissism. Narcissism is actually a personality disorder whose motto can be summarized as, I'm all that matters. The symptoms often include being overly boastful, exaggerating one's own achievements, pretending to be superior to others, lack of empathy for others, impatient, angry, unhappy, depressed, or having mood swings when criticized easily disappointed when expected importance is not given, always craving for the best in everything, has a very fragile self-esteem. Narcissism is an epidemic in our country. Too many people are only interested in their goals, their dreams, the desires, the fulfillment, and their happiness. Everything is evaluated by the question, what's in it for me? The devastating effect of a self-centered culture shows itself in disintegrating families, superficial relationships, frustration, and despair. Superficial relationships are a result of having no time for closeness. People are too busy with their own goals. They can't afford to let a relationship interfere with their career or their plans. And the sad result is many lonely people. If you place yourself at the center of your universe, pretty soon your world becomes very small and meaningless. Self-centeredness never satisfies. It leaves a bitter taste in the mouth. Folks, there's more to life than just you. If you make you the center, if you make yourself a little God, you'll quickly realize life is meaningless. So, what's the solution to self-centeredness? Well, based on Sobel's earlier comments, I suggest that the first and most important solution is to build strong relationships with God and with one another. Get interested in other people. Cultivate friendships. Join a small group. You need other people to give you balance so that you're not so self-centered. You need to make time for relationships, for your own psychological health, 
and your own spiritual health. We know that from the beginning, God saw that it was not good for us to be alone. Caring about somebody else is the fastest way to get your focus off yourself. One of the purposes of the church is to build community. In a selfish society, we need a loving church family, a place where you can belong and become and be what God wants you to be. The second suggestion to combat self-centeredness is to give yourself away through some kind of service. I'm convinced that to be spiritually and emotionally healthy and balanced, everybody needs some form of service on, well, at least a weekly basis, where they voluntarily give themselves away without receiving any personal benefit in return. I think we need it as a counterbalance to what our culture encourages. We have 168 hours each week, and I'm pretty sure that God doesn't want us to spend them all on ourselves. In following Jesus, we are told to pour ourselves out for others. The third suggestion for combating self-centeredness is not a popular one. Every day, we need to find at least one opportunity where we can deny ourselves choosing to do the thing of conviction rather than the thing of convenience. In a society where everybody else is saying live only for yourself, think only for yourself, we as believers must be different. We must go against the flow and not just think of ourselves. What does it mean to really deny yourself? Let me give you a few practical answers. When you can see other people reach goals you failed to reach and see others receive rewards and recognition that you'd like to have without being envious, that's denying yourself. When you see other people's needs being met while your needs are not and you don't question God or fail to be grateful for what you have, that's denying yourself. When you choose to serve your family and put their needs ahead of yours, that's denying yourself. When you don't seek praise or fish for compliments and approval from others, and when you can live without constantly being recognized and applauded, that's denying yourself. When you tell the truth, even at the risk of personal expense, that's denying yourself. And in this day, when you pay your fair share of taxes while many others are cheating, that's denying yourself. When you can accept criticism willingly and learn from it with a teachable attitude, that's denying yourself. When you can be content with less than the best of circumstances without griping or complaining, when you can accept interruptions in your schedule and patiently endure irritations, That's denying yourself. When people break their promises and let you down and you refuse to become bitter, when you are misjudged unfairly and your motives are questioned, you don't retaliate. That's denying yourself. When you are content to let God settle the score, that's denying yourself. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. When we let go of our self-centered life, we will find wholeness and fulfillment. We will revel in the abundance. However, when we hold on to our lives as we have built them, we will lose that abundance, that wholeness. Don't you think it's time to say no to self-centeredness? Amen. Start again. Say
like to invite you into this time of prayer. I will invite you to a time of silence, and then I will say prayers with the people, and then together we can say the Lord's Prayer. The words will be on your screen. Let us pray. Amazing and loving God, we come to you today knowing that you have surrounded us with your love. And yet so often we push you away. So often we fill our lives and our hearts with things that separate us from you. They keep us from your love. They keep us from your beautiful children on this earth. We would ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to your voice, to your love, so that we can share your love with others. On this day, we have so many people in our world that we are concerned about. Those who live in countries that are war-torn. For those who have been caught in the middle of war, who have been pushed one way or another and are now, now still not safe. They're hungry, they're cold, they're depressed. And God, we would ask that you would bring peace to their lands, that you would bring solace to their lives and comfort to their families. We also come knowing that there have been so many other kinds of things that have happened, like, like hurricanes and tornadoes, tsunamis, fires, it feels almost overwhelming. And we know that in the midst of that, you weep with those who weep, and you comfort those who need comfort. We give you thanks for those who act in the capacity of your hands and your feet, the firemen, the policemen, the nurses, the doctors, the teachers, and I could go on and on. God, we give you thanks for those who have heard your call and who reach out with your love. On this day, we are always concerned about the rulers of our world, our nation, our state, and our cities. We would ask that you would allow them to feel the gentle breeze of your spirit, to know what wisdom you are imparting to them and that you would allow them to live into that which they have been called, caring for the people that, that they represent, helping them recognize that it is so much more important to care for others and to work towards compromise and common solutions for the good of all. We give you thanks and we ask your wisdom, your grace, and your peace. Amen. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. on the ways that we say no to God. We reflect on the ways that we have rejected God's love, denied God, entered into conflict with God's beloved children, and ultimately betrayed God's Son. It is a time for us to turn around, to repent, to say no to the things that have separated us from God. And today, you'll note that one of the candles is out. Because today, we have said no. No to self-centeredness. No to single grains. And so I invite you, in these days approaching Easter, to continue to say no to those things that separate you from God, and to gather strength from the example of Jesus as he faced the darkness. Let us see God's love and care shining brightly against the black horizon that looms up in the background. Let us hear the words of Jesus. Peace I leave with you. Mm -hmm. 